We do feel very loved. We have been showered with cards and appreciation, and we, we love you. My name is Pastor Tiffany. My name is Tiffany. I happen to be a pastor. It's not my name. Uh, Tiffany, my husband, Ellie, and I, we do have the great honor of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church, and we love you guys so much. Uh, it's, it's such a joy to just serve you all and to, to speak in your life. So uh, I'm bringing the message this morning. We have been in a series called Be a Lifeline, and the premise of the series, the, the whole point of the series uh, that we've been talking about is this. We were born again when we received God's lifeline, and we truly live when we become a lifeline. So another way that that, that could be stated is this. Uh, when we heard the good news about Jesus and we gave him our life, we were made new, we were born again, and then we were given a second chance to do life a new way with him. Uh, And he has called each and every one of us who has responded to the good news, to respond to who has responded to his message of salvation, to go and to be a lifeline. And I wanted to give you three scriptures that kind of talk about that. Um, If you guys are here and you have your YouVersion Bible app, you can pull up the Bible app on your phone. You can find the events tab. You can find, you can follow the scriptures on there, and the scriptures will also be up on the screen. First of all, I just want to pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you that we are able to gather here publicly on a Sunday morning and just be among brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, and I know that when we are present, you are here uh, among us to minister, and so we just receive everything that you have for us. Uh, Lord, we submit ourselves to you and thank you because you are such a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, scripture number one about how uh, Jesus was our lifeline and then we've been called to be a lifeline. John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. It says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. There's another one in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. It says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And then the last one, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So from those three scriptures, very clearly in the same way that Christ Jesus was sent by God the Father to be a lifeline for us, he said, now go. Now you go and you be a lifeline and bring salvation to other people. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the in-between time. Because it's easy to see like we've been given a lifeline and now we're called to be a lifeline. But we live in the in-between from receiving a lifeline and learning how to become a lifeline. And that's, that's what I want to talk about. So just some encouragement. <clears throat> I've been following Jesus for 18 years. 18 years ago, I gave my life to Jesus, and I've been following him ever since. Uh, but some of my heroes have been following Jesus for more than 40 years. That's a long time, people. And I want to give you some encouragement. We are all in process always. We're always in between. We will never make it to the end. So be encouraged. If you feel like you're in the in-between, like I know I've accepted Jesus or I'm on the fence about Jesus, uh, and I know there's more in life, but I feel like I just can't get out of where I am, take hope, take heart, because you're not alone, and we're, we're all in process. And so I want to talk, talk about that. Um, Luke 19, to, or actually I want to I back up and, and say this part. Uh, we are all in process of growing in our understanding of everything that Jesus has purchased for us, all of us, always. And we are all in process, always, of being able to internalize what Jesus do, is doing in us and through us. And we are always in process of learning to be a lifeline for someone else based on what God has done in us. We're always in process, forever. Uh, so there's a scripture, Luke 19, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So history lesson, the New Testament, all the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, was written in the Greek language. Fun fact. Um, and so it was translated. We're reading it in English because that's what we speak. It's been translated into other languages. Uh, so they translated it, the word save. In the Greek, that word save is the word sozo. And sozo had many meanings. And so I want to share with you uh, what those words meant or what the word could have meant. Uh, To save, 
to deliver, to protect, to heal, to preserve, and to make whole. So another way that that scripture could be stated is the Son of Man came to seek and to deliver the lost. He came to seek and to protect the lost. He came to seek and to heal the lost. He came to seek and preserve the lost. He came to seek and to make the lost whole. And so at one time or another, and possibly even now, uh, we've been lost. Lost just means we were, we were headed for destruction. Our life was on the wrong path. We were going nowhere uh, in a hurry. And Jesus came and he rescued us. He saved us. He showed us another way. Um, and so the, the scripture says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So he came to deliver us. Jesus came to deliver us. He came to protect us. He came to heal us. He came to preserve us, and he came to make us whole. A well-known pastor by the name of uh, Jack Hayford has been quoted as saying this, the essence of salvation or being saved is deliverance. And deliverance is to exchange what we know for what we need. I'll say it again. The essence of salvation or the essence of being saved is deliverance. And deliverance is to exchange what we know for what we need. So I want to share with you two of the things we believe at Lifeline. We believe a lot of things, but here are two of them. Number one is that we are hope dealers, exchanging lies for truth. And assisting God in rebuilding his masterpiece is our business. We don't just show up, we grow up. And another thing we believe is that we are transparent and we're unashamed. It is our strength that people look up to, but it is our weakness that people can relate to. And so we live unmasked, never afraid to be ourselves. Amen. God is so good, and he has a plan and a purpose for each and every life. I am so, I'm so happy to be here today with all of you. No matter where you are at on your journey, God, God has a plan for you. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to illustrate the spiritual truth of deliverance, exchanging what we know for what we need and how we're all in process. We've received God's lifeline, if we've received God's lifeline, and we're learning to become a lifeline. So, um, so what I want to do is hopefully illuminate the fact that we, we can be saved but still need deliverance. We still need to be delivered. We still need to be set free from some things, even if we've given our life to Jesus. So as we go through life, this is what happens to each and every one of us. As we go through life, we formulate thoughts about ourself, about the world, about the people around us. Um, and what happens is as thoughts come into our mind, we either agree with them or we disagree with them. You guys ever had thoughts? And you ever had thoughts? Okay, we had thoughts. So let's 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 give an example of some thoughts. So sometimes maybe we'll think these are funny. Um, I'm better than Johnny because I can run faster than he can. And so, do you agree with that? You're better. You're yeah. better than other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and accept that thought, and we're gonna walk around like we're better than other people. Okay. Here's another thought. I believe that I am alone. Because my parents don't have time for me, they don't take an interest in my life, whatever the case is that, that may be that thought. Do you believe that you're alone? Yes. Okay, so she's going to go, she agrees with that thought, she's going to take it. Now she's going to live like she's better than people and she's alone. Okay, here's another thought. Uh, I believe that it's my job to keep the peace. Maybe you're the middle child or your parents fight all the time and so for some reason, uh, who knows, it became your responsibility to keep the peace in the house. Uh, do you believe that it's your job to keep the peace, make everybody happy? Yes. Okay, so now all of a sudden she's, she's all these things. She's the peacekeeper, she's alone, she's better than other people. Here's, here's one. I believe that I have been abandoned. I've been abandoned by God and I've been abandoned by other people because something happened in my life and no one was there to rescue me. No one was there to save me. Do you believe that you've been abandoned? Yep. That was another thought. And so what happens is if we agree with the thoughts that enter our mind, it's to say that we trust them or that we believe in them. And the thoughts that we believe in are the thoughts that guide how we live our life. They're the thoughts that we give authority to in our life. And so if, if a thought has an authority, if a thought has authority in our life, then we obey it. So based on the experiences that we've had in life, we make assumptions and we make judgments about the world and about people. 
and about situations. These, these judgments, these thoughts, these beliefs, they frame how we live each day. They frame how we make decisions. They frame how we respond to other people. Uh, if we're the peacekeeper, then we're going to make everybody happy and we're going to be people pleasing. And it's going to be this innate drive inside of us. Maybe we don't like it, maybe we don't agree with it, but we can't stop it because we made some judgments. Uh, if we believe that we're alone or abandoned, <clears throat> maybe we'll be real reactive in situations. When, it, when an issue or a confrontation comes up, we either you know, revert into our box or we explode because we're afraid of being alone or we're afraid of being abandoned. So the thoughts we have, they do determine how we respond in situations. Uh, for most of us, I'm going to say this, though. We don't know what we believe. Uh, I, we don't know the judgments that we've made about life. We don't know what thoughts have attached themselves to us that help you know, frame how we make decisions. Uh, it's usually not until a major life change occurs or pressure is put on us that we realize we've got some stuff in our life. Uh, we've got some things that are keeping us from moving forward. So let's, let's give an example of a major life change. Um, because we're at church today, let's talk about giving our life to Jesus. If we make a decision for Jesus, it could be like, everything's going great, we're feeling good, we're, we're starting new life, all the Christian people are telling me life, my life is going to be amazing. And then uh, you realize that Jesus is calling you to forgive some people. And you discover that you've got resentment in your heart, and you can't let go of it. Because some people have hurt you, they've wronged you, and you don't want to forgive them. It's impossible for you to forgive them, you think. And so now you walk around and you're resentful. You've got some, you're kind of resent, you're mad at God. You're mad at God. Because he wants you to forgive the people who hurt you. And he's like, and you're saying, I need you, I need you to act on my behalf. And he's saying, I just want you to forgive them. And so all of a sudden now we've got some anger in our heart. Here's another one. Uh, let's say you have to make a career change. Whatever that is, if you're moving from like college to a, a job or you're, you're in a successful job and you have to move to a new job and you got to start at the bottom and climb your way back up. And now all of a sudden you're jealous, jealous of the people around you who are doing better than you, who are more successful than you. And so now you realize I've got some, I have some jealous feelings in my life. <clears throat> Here's another one. Uh, you get promoted. This is great. Great news. You got a promotion. We have, we are, we're elevating you. We're going to pay you more. And now we're going to ask you to do more. And so you become fearful. What was great, you realize some pressure has been put on you, and you've got some fear. Maybe some things happened in your past, and you're afraid of those things resurfacing, or some things in your past you haven't dealt with. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, they come back up in your life, and you've got fear that didn't exist before. And so now we've got all these uh, these judgments. We've got these beliefs, again, who are f that frame how we live our life. Now, whatever the case is that triggers our becoming aware, whether it was a major life change or pressure is put on us, generally our response tends to be the same. We try and work our way out of not feeling this way. You know, we say, we're just going to try, we're just going to try harder. We're going to pretend like we're not jealous. We're going to pretend like we're not angry. We're going to pretend like we're not resentful. We're going to praise God. Everything is good. God is so good. Amen. I gave my life to Jesus. He is doing new things. That's true. But are you letting him? Because letting him means you got to deal with some stuff. And so we can't work our way out of feeling this way. And believe me, if you've ever tried, then what happens is you get really tired of trying and all the ick you've tried to bury is just on your sleeve. And it's like you can't hide it anymore. It just exists and it's there and it's, you feel hideous about it and you can't get rid of it. But there is hope. It's in these moments when we realize we can't make a change that we realize we've given authority to a stronghold of thoughts in our life that keep us from moving forward or experiencing peace. And the stronghold of, the stronghold of thoughts in our life, they, keep, they, may, they immobilize us. So we cannot high five or hug a friend who has something else to celebrate. Um, when there's a stronghold of jealous thoughts in your life, it's really hard to celebrate the wins of other people because you're so focused on where you are not. Here's another one. So remember the verses I read in the beginning where Jesus came to be our lifeline. I read the three scriptures. He came to be our lifeline and he said, now go, you go be a lifeline. And then Luke 19, 10, where Jesus said he came to seek and to deliver the lost. When we are better than the people around us, 
We cannot extend our hand to lift somebody else up. When we're the peacekeeper, it's really hard to kneel before Jesus and let him be our peace. But there's hope. There's hope. That's what I want to get to. Uh, So at Lifeline, remember, these are things we believe. We are hope dealers. Exchanging lies for truth is our business. Assisting God in rebuilding his masterpiece, which is you. Scripture says you are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good things that he has planned long ago. For each and every one of us, he says that. And it's true for you as an individual where he wants to take you. It's your business. It's our business to exchange lies for truth and grow up. We don't just show up, we grow up. And another thing, we are transparent and unashamed. It is our strength that people look up to, but it's our weakness that people relate to. You got to know that other people have dealt with the things you are dealing with, that they have overcome. They've been through them and they've overcome them. We're not pretending like nothing's ever happened in our life. Uh, John 10.10 says this, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. But I have come, Jesus says, that they may have life and have it to the full. So the thief is the enemy who would have us believe that all of our thoughts are true. Every single thought you ever have, the enemy's going to tell you, that's true. That's true. Pick it up. Believe it. Walk around like that. And the enemy would also have us destroyed. But Jesus said he came to give us life and that our life would be full. So let me tell you a story. A couple months ago, over the summer, I went to a conference, and it was about, it was like a freedom conference. I've talked about this a little bit before. Um, and while I was there, <clears throat> Jesus revealed to me that I deal, I was dealing with feelings of jealousy. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Um, and jealousy is just a symptom. So we can be jealous for many reasons. But for me personally, this is, this is what he showed me. And I was like, good Lord, I did not know that was there. <laughs> um, but I felt like there, a thought came to my mind that I had been looked over. From just a bunch of experiences in my life, I felt like I'd been looked over. Um, I, this, this is funny. I'm generally pretty reserved and quiet. And so when I meet people, I'll meet them seven times and they won't remember that they've met me. And so the thought is I'm overlooked. Okay? So a series of things had taken place in my life that solidified this thought, I am overlooked. Nobody sees me. And so as things were coming up in my life and, you know, I'm moving forward and and different things are happening, I had given, I had let that thought take authority in my life and I created a stronghold. And so now when other people were promoted around me, I was coming into competition with them instead of releasing them because I was jealous. And so the Lord Lord brought that up. So I, I began to make that exchange over the summer. So now here's the cool thing. I was aware that it existed. And so instead of believing the thought, I was beginning to exchange the thought. That's not true because you haven't overlooked me, God. But I, it wasn't all the way gone yet. So here's the thing. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference, completely different. And I was surrounded by people, people left of me, the right of me, in front of me. And something was happening. There was someone on the platform and I was watching them. And I was being so judgmental and I was being so critical. You ever been there where you just assume the position and you kind of just watch? You know, and so I had all these, these thoughts about how, I don't even know what they were, but it was ridiculous. And it was like, in that moment, nobody knew this, but the Lord pressed me, and he said, do you want her to fail because of the thoughts that I was having? And I was like, no, no. My heart isn't that that person would fail. And he said, this is what he said to me, he said, you've got some pride, and you've got some jealousy, and you've got to deal with it. Because I cannot promote you and I cannot move you forward if you stay here. Because for me, when I'm when I'm jealous of somebody, when I'm operating with with thoughts and feelings of jealousy, I'm coming into competition with the very people that I'm supposed to release. And so I needed I needed to make an exchange. And so I don't know about you, but when I'm dealing with or focused on the thoughts that the enemy has planted in my mind, I don't feel like I'm living life to the full. In fact, I get pretty down on myself when I realize that that stuff is happening. I'm like, man, I don't want to feel that way. And then, you know, what happens is the enemy says, you're no, you're no good. You're not worth it. You should be ashamed of that. And so then you just, you go farther and farther into your dark place, into your dark circle, and you just stay there, which is right where the enemy wants you. 
And it's okay to find yourself here. I want to bring that up because it's okay to find yourself here. We're all in process, always. Always. We are all in process, always. And at Lifeline, we are transparent and unashamed. We're going to recognize that we have some weaknesses which need to be surrendered to Jesus. We're not going to stay there. We're going to show up and we're going to grow up. And we're going to move into everything that God has purchased for us. So uh, 2 Corinthians, just for a second, praise God that he is so good and that he has given us his word and he showed us a way out. So 2 Corinthians, I'm going to give you the action steps here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. It says this, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So God says that we have divine power to demolish strongholds. Not that he has divine power. He does, but he says you do. You have divine power to demolish the strongholds in your life. You have divine power to come against the arguments that keep you from moving forward. And it's very simple, but here it is. You have got to put your weapon into practice. Uh, And it's easy, 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 but we just got to do it. I've been practicing it, and let me tell you, it's amazing when we actually practice it. So here's the thing. He says, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So thoughts, they run through our mind all the time all the time. And so to take captive a thought, you got to catch it. And by catch it, I mean when it's running through your mind, start saying it out loud. Because it's, it's, it, when, it, when it comes out loud, then you're taking it captive. If it's just running through your mind like, I'm alone, nobody cares about me, whatever. And you just replay it over and over and over in your mind. But if you say it out loud, I am alone. Whew, let's, let's get there. Okay, so here we go. When we recognize that there's a stronghold in our life, then Jesus can begin to do his work. Yikes. Okay, so the stronghold comes off. And when the stronghold is off, Jesus is able to come in and he's able to take these thoughts. We can begin to take these thoughts captive and surrender them to Jesus. Now what that looks like is this. Father, I believe that I am better than other people. I believe that I'm better than other people. I look around and I'm better at her. I'm better than her. I'm better than him. I'm better than other people. What do you have for me? Is this true? And he says this. No, you're not better than other people. You're my coworker. You're my coworker. I want you to come into partnership with me because all my people have a part to play. Do you believe that you're God's coworker? He's called you to work with other people? Here's another one. I believe that I am alone. Nobody sees me. This struggle is all my own. I'm dealing with it on my own. Nobody wants to help me. It's my fault. I'm alone. And so we go to make the exchange. But what happens is sometimes sometimes we want to keep it. Sometimes we want to keep it. Jesus says, you are never alone. When we begin to make the exchange, he says, you're never alone. Is it falling off? I will, go be, I will go before you. I will go with you. I am ahead of you. I am before you. You are not forsaken. You are never alone. But what happens is we don't believe it. We put it back and we say, no, no, that's not true. You're probably there for other people. But there's situations in my life where I felt like I've been alone and no one was there. So I don't, I'm not ready to believe that. I'm not ready to pick that truth up yet. But we're ready to exchange some other ones. So Let's go ahead and exchange this one. I'm the peacekeeper. It's my job to keep the peace. Um, I have to make everybody happy. I can't have a need. I can't have a struggle because then someone else would be let down. It's my job to keep the peace. Jesus, is that true? Have you called me to be the peacemaker? And he says, no. I've called you to be free. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So don't let yourself be loked again yoked again to that burden of slavery. Do you believe that you're free? Yeah. It was my job to keep the peace? Yes. <laughs> Here's another one. We believe that we've been abandoned. Whatever, whatever the, the thing is, you, you were abandoned. You were left alone. I believe I'm abandoned because when I was there in that room, no one was there. No one knew what was happening. No one came to save me. I was abandoned. Not abandoned by people. I've been abandoned by you, God. You weren't there. You didn't come through for me. Is that true? And he says, no. 
You are my beloved. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I was there in the room. I don't want to speak to you about it. Let me show you where I was. Let me bring healing to that place. Do you believe that you are beloved? Here's the other one. I believe that I'm jealous. Or I know that I am. I know that I'm jealous. I feel like I've been overlooked. There are places in my life where nobody seems to recognize the things that I'm doing. And so I, I'm, I'm holding on to feelings of jealousy. Jesus, is this who you've called me to be? And he says, no. You're delighted in I delight in you. I rejoice over you with singing. I love you, and I see you. Do you believe that you're delighted in? Yes. I'm resentful. Father, I, I feel like I can't forgive those people for what they did to me. I just can't, I can't let go of it, and I'm resentful, and I'm, and I'm grumpy, and I'm angry, and I, I can't move forward in life. Jesus, is this my lot in life? Is this as far as I'm going to go? And he says, No. You are forgiven. I have forgiven you for some things. Big things, little things. And now I've called you to go and forgive other people. And I've given you the grace and I've given you the courage and I've given you the ability to do it. You are forgiven. Do you believe that you're forgiven for some things? Yes. I'm fearful. I'm afraid of my future. Lord, I, I look forward and I see that there, there are big things, there are good things but I don't know if I can get there. I don't know if I have what it takes. Is this true? Is this, do I need to be afraid? And he says, no. Because you have put your faith in me, <clears throat> you can be very bold, he says. Do you believe that you can be bold in Christ? Yeah. <clears throat> so being saved by Jesus means to be in process. Another way we can say that it is being saved is to be being delivered it's to be in process of exchanging what we know for what we need and so another opportunity comes up where we get to exchange again we start feeling alone in a new situation in a new thing solidifying old thoughts and we say father i'm dealing with being alone again i'm be i'm dealing with being alone again is this true am i alone and again his response is the same he says no you are never alone. I am with you and I will go before you. Never will I leave you. He says, I sent my son for you. I want you. I want to be in relationship with you. I want you to bring me all of your problems. I want to meet you in every situation. I gave you my son Jesus so that you could have all that you need. <clears throat> Do you believe what God says is true? That you're never alone. And so what happens is, is we, we have this opportunity in our life to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We don't have to believe every thought that comes into our life, but we can surrender it to Jesus and ask for the replacement. What is the truth? And so it's, what we do is we simply do this. We confess the belief and we repent for believing it, and then we let Jesus speak the truth. It's as simple as this. Father, I confess that I have believed that I've been looked over. I repent for living like that is the truth. You have said that you delight in me and that you see me. And so I come into agreement with your words. And I thank you that you have set me free from feelings of jealousy. And we can do this every day. Whenever we realize we have some beliefs that are keeping us from growing up or walking in peace and freedom, then we can exchange the lie for the truth. There's a, there's a scripture, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and it says, we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. Not everything that we think or see is the truth. There is an enemy who would love to deceive us. He lives to deceive us, who would have us believe that all of our thoughts are true. Deliverance isn't about what we are being set free from, 
but who we are being set free to become. Jesus has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. And so what happens is we either come into agreement with God's truth about who he says we are, or we come into agreement with the enemy and we live bound by a stronghold of thoughts where we miss what God intends for our life. And so we become a lifeline to other people when we use the tools that God has given us, in this case, our mouth, (laughs) the ability to take those thoughts captive and to step into freedom. All the while, we're being transparent and leading the people around us to do the very same thing we're doing. We're recognizing we've got some things in our life, we're bringing it to Jesus, and then we're bringing others along with us. And so as I've been speaking this morning, I want to give everyone just an opportunity to respond. Um, If you felt like something was happening inside of you while I was talking, as I'm talking about the lies, as I'm talking about the truth, and there are some things that you want to exchange in your life, then... Uh, The worship team is going to come up. They're going to play one song. And while they're playing this song, this is your opportunity. This is your chance. You can come to the the front. You can come to the front. This is open. You can just turn around in your chair. You can do nothing in your chair, Uh, whatever you're comfortable with. But if you felt like something was moving in your heart or you got really hot or you started to cry, those are all responses, and the Lord is ministering to you. And so it would be foolish of us not to give you an opportunity to respond to the living God who wants to speak to you, who has a plan, and who has a purpose for your life. And so while they're singing, make the exchange. And the exchange is this, Father, I believe blank. Is this true? And you'll just wait for a second, and immediately Jesus will give you an answer. And let me tell you this. It's so immediate that it feels fake. And it's so good that it feels like a lie. And so what will happen is if you hear something and it feels like, man, that's too good to be true. You can't be saying that about me. That's the enemy who would tell you stay bound. Stay right where you are. But it... If you can bring yourself to make the exchange, then there are pens in almost every chair. And you can write on a tithe envelope. There's paper. I don't care. Find a piece of paper in your bulletin, whatever. If you hear, if you feel like Jesus said something, you're thinking you're hearing something, and it's not usually out loud. It's like in your brain, like something happens. And you're like, where'd that come from? It's a paper airplane of a thought. It's like, where did that come from? You write it down. Write it down and begin to make the exchange. Father, I'm having a hard time believing this is true because of my life experience, but I really want to. So Father, I confess for believing that this is true and I make the exchange. I receive what you are saying to me. So the worship team is gonna sing one song. The service isn't over. This is simply a time of response. So go ahead and and do whatever you're gonna do as you respond to the Lord during this time.